The News 4 Rundown is sponsored by FH Fur. Virginia voters are headed to the primary polls tomorrow, and Democrats are accusing Republicans of meddling in the election. Political experts explain what's going on in two northern Virginia counties and how it could impact who wins. And commemorating Juneteenth, how communities across the area are coming together to mark this important day in American history. Plus, college cost confusion. Ted Oberg and the News 4 I team dig into why so many colleges aren't telling you the full cost of attending and why higher education experts are pleading with Congress to do something about it. You're watching the News 4 Rundown. And thanks for joining us for the News 4 Rundown. It's our newscast streaming for you. I'm Tommy McFly. And I'm Un Yang. It's Monday, June 19th. And we begin with a look at some of the top stories we're following. Over the weekend, we saw a deadly outbreak of violence. There have been seven separate shootings in D.C. alone since Saturday morning. In total, there were 11 victims. Four people were killed, including two young teenagers. D.C. police say investigators were able to make one arrest in one of the shootings over the weekend, but no arrests in any of the homicides. Tonight, investigators say a deadly stabbing inside an Arlington apartment building stemmed from an argument between the suspect and the victim. Police were called to the Telegar apartments in Washington Boulevard around 5 a.m., and they say that Shantae Crawford and Ali Mami Forna got into an argument and Forna stabbed Crawford. She was pronounced dead on the scene. Police arrested Forna and charged him with murder. The superintendent of Fairfax County Public Schools has apologized to the school system's teachers for an email that some employees have called cruel and insensitive. This message was sent to teachers that said they were receiving gift cards from the school district, but that was not the case. It was actually a phishing test to gauge the staff's response to email attacks. And on the eve of Virginia's primaries, there's an unprecedented push in two counties to encourage Republicans to vote in Democrat primary races. GOP leaders in Fairfax and Loudoun County are urging Republican voters to cast ballots for very specific candidates. Northern Virginia Bureau Chief Julie Carey takes a look at what's behind this unusual strategy and what Democrats have to say about it. Just reminding you to vote in the primary tomorrow. Loudoun County's Democratic Party chairman outdoing last minute canvassing with his son to remind his Democratic neighbors to vote tomorrow. But a few days ago, the county's Republican committee began sending out these messages, asking GOP voters to go to the polls too and cast ballots for this list of four Democratic candidates. The Republican committee in Loudoun County is explicitly asking Republican voters to come vote in our Democratic primary for a slate of candidates that the Republican committee have endorsed. I've never seen that anywhere in modern American political history. Because Virginia voters don't register by party, anyone is free to vote in these open primaries, whether they consider themselves a Republican, Democrat, or independent. One focus of the GOP push in Loudoun, defeating incumbent Commonwealth attorney Buda Biberai. So they're asking party members to vote for Democratic challenger Elizabeth Lancaster. But in the three General Assembly contests, Republicans have a different motivation. It's a strategy designed to weaken the Democratic Party, uh, nominating uh, less competitive candidates for the general election can only help Republicans. In Fairfax, Republicans are only encouraging votes in one Democratic primary. Like their neighbors in Loudoun, they're seeking to defeat an incumbent Commonwealth attorney, Steve Descano. They're critical of his criminal justice reform platform. He's being challenged by Democrat Ed Nuttall. The move meant a major policy change. Fairfax Republican Committee rules barred members from voting in Democratic primaries. But Republican Supervisor Pat Harrity convinced party leaders to make an exception. But this race was just too important and too critical to public safety in Fairfax County. So I asked uh, the party to waive that requirement, and the party did waive that requirement for this one race. We now need six. Back in Loudoun, this party leader says he's hoping what he calls GOP meddling might inspire even more Democrats to go to the polls tomorrow. I can't tell you what we're doing, which is just making sure that every Democratic voter does know that this is happening, that the Republicans are trying to get conservative voters to crash our primary and we're urging every Democrat that lives in Loudoun County to come out and vote in the primary so that Democrats actually pick the Democratic nominee. But political analysts say in these low turnout primaries, these Republican pushes could have an impact on the outcome. In Loudoun County, I'm Julie Carey, News 4. 
Thanks for that, Julie Carey. And great news. There are several events and happenings celebrating all on the DMV today, honoring the end of slavery in the United States. Today is known as Juneteenth. The Anacostia Community Museum held its Juneteenth Festival. There were a lot of music performances, double Dutch, a gardening workshop, trivia, and more. The museum say today's event was a way to honor the present and reflect on shared tradition and history. And dozens of people turned out to join Juneteenth celebrations at National Harbor. This is the second year for the Juneteenth Freedom Celebration. The event featured local artists and performers, including poetry readings, African drumming and percussion classes, and other educational activities. Organizers really wanted to offer a mix of artistic expression and cultural diversity. And the Emancipation Proclamation was on temporary display for the long weekend that coincided with the Juneteenth holiday. As you can see, people turned out in droves to see this document at the National Archives. And the proclamation is now 160 years old. Although the temporary display is over, the archives made a big announcement about where it'll be housed in the future. It's the intention of the National Archives to permanently display the Emancipation Proclamation in the rotunda. The Emancipation Proclamation will eventually join the Declaration of Independence, Constitution, and the Bill of Rights. An investigation found former D.C. Deputy Mayor John Falcicchio sexually harassed a city employee. The mayor's office of legal counsel released a summary of its findings Saturday night. And News 4's Juliana Valencia has the details of those allegations and the findings of the investigation. Yeah, Falcecchio actually resigned from the mayor's office back in March, just one week after the investigation began. The mayor's office of legal counsel looked into eight complaints filed against the former deputy mayor. Two of those complaints were substantiated by the office of legal counsel. One complaint said that on two occasions, Falcecchio engaged in unwanted sexual advances. The other substantiated complaint said Falcecchio sent thousands of inappropriate texts texts to the employee's personal phone. While the employee's attorney praised her for stepping forward and for her unwavering courage. There are also complaints made by another female employee. The investigation into those allegations is ongoing. Now we reached out to Falcecchio for a response, but I've not heard back yet. Back to you. That was Julia Valencia reporting. The cost to rent is only getting more expensive. Recent data from Zillow shows the average American is spending just above $2,000 a month on rent. A yard care business, Lawn Love, ranked this year's most expensive metro areas for renters. And if you guessed our region would make the list, you would be right. Mm. The D.C., Arlington, Alexandria area was ranked ninth. Renters in the New York City tri-state area are paying more than anyone in the U.S. Not surprised about that one. That's followed by the Miami-Fort Lauderdale area in second. Four metro areas in California also made that list. Normally we love being on the top of the list, but I'm glad yeah. we're not on the top of this list. It's very expensive to live here, though, for yes. sure. So it's likely we're just days now from the Supreme Court getting involved in ruling in Pen uh, President Biden's COVID era college loan forgiveness program. It could forgive ten to twenty thousand dollars of student loan debt for millions of Americans. But the News 4i team knows as your family looks toward college, regardless of the court decision, the cost of college is astronomical. Investigative reporter Ted Oberg found not only are students and parents looking for help with cost, experts say they need Congress's help just to get colleges to tell us the truth behind the bill. The class of 2023. High school graduation is and should be a day full of dreams. It's like you've worked so hard for a specific thing and when it comes, it's just like, wow. A time to reflect on what's ahead. Feels exciting. Well, maybe a little apprehension too. Why are you nervous? Just to not fall on the stage. Sure. Diego Coronado. He did just fine, by the way, and is pretty sure of his next step. University of Michigan. Many of his classmates at Montgomery County's Magruder High know theirs too. I'm going to MC. I'm going to like UMBC. But neither they nor their parents seem to know one pretty important detail about what lies ahead exactly what that college education will cost. That's a really good question. Taylor Collins is planning to study neuroscience at the University of Colorado at Boulder this fall, where her mom, Christine, has an idea of the price tag, more than 30 grand a year for out-of-state students like Taylor. We don't know truly the actual bottom line as of yet. Students and their families deserve to know that price. Melissa Emery Aris researches higher education for the Government Accountability Office. Her team released a report 
examining more than 500 financial aid offers from colleges across the country and found almost all of them. Don't estimate the true net price of college or understate it by excluding things like the cost of books or housing. 91% of colleges are not providing that out-of-pocket cost for students. Emery Aris said federal education leaders recommend 10 best practices to make these financial aid offers easier to follow. Things like itemizing all costs and separating aid from loans. But she says... Colleges are choosing not to follow them. We heard from people during our work that they have an incentive to not tell people what the full cost is. Because if they do so, it will make their school look more expensive. The GAO says Congress needs to fix it. And a group representing college financial aid officers agrees. There are things lawmakers and policymakers can do to mandate some minimal standards on financial aid offers. Justin Drager is the president of that national group of college financial aid officers. He says in most cases, confusion on these offers isn't intentional, blaming complexity of data and short staffing. We can't make any excuses for schools that are purposefully trying to hide or disguise their costs. Pointing to that GAO report, Drager says government guidance hasn't always been helpful. One out of three schools in their report were using a federal template created by the Department of Education and still failed to meet the 10 standards that were put forward by the Government Accountability Office. These answers matter more than ever, as the average four-year college now costs $35,000 a year, twice what it was two decades ago, and the average federal student loan debt is 37 grand. Have we done enough? No. Virginia Senator Tim Kaine supports legislation that would expand loan forgiveness for public sector employees, increase the Pell Grant for low-income students, and expand it to job training programs. But like a couple of the bills that would increase cost transparency, none of those ideas have moved forward either. We've done a lot of different things, but sometimes it's one step forward, two steps back. Elizabeth Berganza Solis. This Magruder grad says she knows what she's going to pay to attend George Washington this fall after scholarships told us $15,600 a year. Price was 100% a big, big factor. She's planning to attend med school one day, trying to figure out how to pay for that dream, too. I've started investing. <laughs> and what 18-year-old knows to start investing to pay off eventual costs of medical school? Wow. Look, this is incredibly important because according to the Education Data Initiative, college graduates in our area, our neighbors, have some of the highest federal student loan debt in the nation. Look at this. Virginia's student loan debt, about $40,000 per student. Maryland, wow. 43. That D.C. number, nearly 55 grand. Tommy wow. Owen is the highest in the nation. It is a huge burden for students as they leave school. And they have to think about that as they try to plan for their future when they know they're going to be saddled with this kind of debt. And, and they should know exactly what it's going to cost. Look, if a family wants to take on that kind of debt, fine. But what the GAO is saying is at least tell people what it's going to cost if 91% of those American colleges are hiding the ball even a little bit on that. Who does that hurt? Right. And when it comes to that, are you able to, like... I don't want to say negotiate with them, but if they're not giving you transparent, can you get back at them and, and start haggling a bit? Has, has well, that been look, happening? I, I don't know if you can necessarily haggle over the price of college, although one of the things we found out researching this project is that few people pay the sticker price on tuition, right? Colleges are giving a lot of aid these days. But what you need to ask, either as a student or as a parent of a student, is tell me the exact cost. Sometimes they use a phrase, the cost of attendance, which would then wrap in everything. Tuition, housing, food, books, travel, some personal expenses. There are a whole host of costs, you guys know this, uh, that go along with college. And you're living that life right now. Is. Oh yeah, Ted and I both have a child who's about to head off to college and we know that I have to ask for the full amount because it's gonna be a lot. <laughs> I'm scared. Well, because you're budgeting for it. Yes, I and, am. And colleges know that. One of the goals of this law is to create a standard process, right? Some sort of standard sheet that all of us would get from any college, one of our children is choosing to attend, or one that we may want to go to to get a second degree. So that way you can compare apples to apples no matter where you're looking in the country.
Standardized work. Well, the News 4 I team had the story about the SUVs and that got the, the attention of the Hill. So who knows where this is going to go? Ted Oberg, Let's thank go. you so much. You bet. Thanks, Ted. Appreciate you very much. And still ahead, you never want Ted Oberg to call you. You're like, when Ted Oberg calls, <laughs> you did something. And he's going to find out what it is. Today is the start of civic season. And I'm going to explain what that is and put my pal on Yang fresh back from vacation to the test. The last time I did this, it wasn't good. <laughs> And a major shakeup in DC sports. Why star Bradley Beal is leaving the Washington Wizards. I utility bills got you down and looking to save a little dough. Call the guy on the back of the truck. Thinking it may be time to replace that old worn out heating and cooling system. Call the guy on the back of the truck. How about a full system tune up and inspection for just 49 bucks. Call the guy on the back of the truck. He's FH Fur, And when it comes to plumbing, heating, air conditioning and electrical, he and his team of knowledgeable, highly trained technicians are absolutely the best. 877-GOFFER. FHFUR.com. Welcome back. Did you know today kicks off civic season? It's a new movement led by museums and organizations all around the country to get Americans more engaged in democracy, mm -hmm. which is a good thing. Tommy's here with a preview. And you're going to take us back to school. A, a little bit. I was a bit. good student. <laughs> Perfect. I'm not afraid. I was a good student. I was. <laughs> then this will be easy for you. So civic uh. season has a lofty goal where they're making civics interesting and fun. And the timing is really important in the calendar, too, between the oldest federal holiday, which is the 4th of July, and the newest, Juneteenth. So civic season has got a program by Made by Us, a nationwide nonpartisan coalition of history organizations. And here at home. Speak up, speak up. You've got to speak. We've got to hear from you. Speak. God. We have a hip hop song. We have a Latin American song. So we're trying to bring a little bit more of a colorful lens to the whole civic journey. And it's just going to be a big celebration. Uh, it's going to be right here in Silver Spring in the festive lower tap room of denizens. We'll have civic songs. We'll have a live and a silent auction. But it's really, you know, some of what we're about is building community. Let's look at four more local ways to get involved. At the MLK Library in D.C., the National Women's History Museum has an awesome exhibit on black feminists called We Who Believe in Freedom. Stroll the National Mall with Walk D.C.'s Tour of the Monuments. Or stay home and check out the Trail to Indigenous Peoples Day. It's a virtual exhibit from D.C. Humanities. And the D.C. History Center has an online quiz to test your knowledge of D.C. voting history. And you bet I brought a pop quiz for you, Anya. Okay. <laughs> and Ted just left. You can't, you don't even I have know, any backup. I can't backup. ask him for, you know, those lifelines. <laughs> Phone it, Ted. Here's the question. At two points in history, Congress and the U.S. President granted Washingtonians the voting delegate in Congress. Who were those two presidents that did it? Was it George Washington and FDR? Okay. Was it Ulysses S. Grant and Richard Nixon? Or was it John Quincy Adams and William Jefferson Clinton? I'm going to go with C. C. The Quincy last Adams. one. I wish I had a buzzer. Yeah, I can't get one right, can I? Ulysses S. Grant and Richard Nixon. You know, that was my gut, and then I changed my mind because, you know, because Nixon. But yeah. then, yeah. all right, I should have just gone with my gut. It was the two time, well, probably the only time in history those two guys are ever going to be put in the same This is category. what I'm saying. It didn't make sense. Yeah. Right? Okay. That's the fun of civics. So you mm -hmm. can make your own civics plan. You can build your own itinerary and learn more about this at thecivicseason.com. Clearly, I need to do some homework. <laughs> I mean, I realize that after the earlier shows mm -hmm. during the day and now this, that I, I don't know enough. In fairness, though, um, the DC History Center quiz that I brought these questions from, I got, like, almost all of them wrong. They're it's, hard. It's tough. They're hard. But okay. that's what civic season is about. We get go. to freshen up. There you go. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Tommy. Well, big news for the Washington Wizards. The team is trading star Bradley Beal to the Phoenix Suns. This is a major shakeup to the roster as Beal has been the face of the franchise for so many years. Beal, who is waving a no trade clause to make this happen was the third overall pick by the Wizards in 2012. Spent 11 years in D.C. The three-time All-Star who has dealt with several injuries over the last few seasons had just completed the first year of a five-year, $251 million contract. 12-time All-Star Chris Paul is reportedly part of the group the Wizards will get in return, though he will likely be traded to another team. This is all about rebuilding the Wizards franchise. You know? True story. And a guy who's already built, Love Francis, Francis Tiafo. Tiafo. Oh my gosh. Rising up the ranks since his days at the Junior Tennis Champion Center in College Park. And now he's reaching even new heights after winning the Boss Open in Germany over the weekend. His third career title, yes. the Prince George's County native, is moving up to top 10 in the ATP rankings. Yes.
Yes. First time in his career. So Tiafo becomes the third black American man to break into the top 10 with, get this, Arthur Ashe and James Blake also previously accomplishing that feat. And he always comes back to mm -hmm. his roots and he talks to young tennis players who are part of programs here in the Washington DC area, comes back to Hyattsville, and I just think he's fantastic. Love Absolutely. following him and root cheering for him big time. Yep, Beal's gone, Tiafo's on the rise, and Washington Commanders, they've added a new MVP to their season's oh, team. The organization announced <laughs> its team dog named Goldie will be the most valuable pup of the 2023 season. Look at this, Aww. good boy, or oh, good girl, sorry. She she is a four-month-old <laughs> English yellow lab. This is part of the commander's partnership with Canines for Warriors, which provides military veterans who have fallen on hard times with service dogs. Mm. The partnership started last season. Goldie is from North Carolina. She is so pretty. She will stay with the volunteer while she learns the basic skills. Then she'll be partnered with a veteran after the season ends. So cool. Oh, these dogs make such a difference. Yep. You know? Hail really to Goldie. Mm -hmm. And I guess Goldie was probably where they had to go because... There's not a lot of burgundy dogs burgundy, running around. Right, right. Yeah. <laughs> so and Goldie's a cute name, too. Very, very cute. We learned that walking has powerful health benefits. We know this. It can protect against heart disease, type 2 diabetes, and even cancer. Even if 10,000 steps is not the right number for you, a new study suggests your risk of premature death decreases as your daily step count increases. Consumer reporter Susan Hogan is working for you with the best ways to track your steps. Do you get 10,000 steps a day? For most of us, that's roughly five miles. But if 10,000 steps a day sounds like a too lofty of a goal, take heart. People who step less may still see big health benefits. Higher step counts have been associated with a lower risk of things like sleep apnea, reflux, and depression. But even a 15 minute stroll can help improve your mood, reduce stress, and help you sleep better. Generally, experts say the more you walk, the more benefits you'll get. Need some motivation? A fitness tracker or smartwatch could help you reach your goals. CR tests both types of gadgets to count your steps, check your heart rate, and track your sleep, and recommends the Fitbit Inspire 3 and the Apple Watch SE. Remember that there's no one correct number of steps for every person. Any amount of walking that gets you up and out of your chair is a step in the right direction. To figure out your step goal, start by quantifying how many steps you get in a typical week. Then increase your daily average by 500. Once you can hit that new number regularly for a week, add another 500. Ready to get started? CR's got some tips. Wear good fitting shoes and bright colors. Walk with good posture. If you have balance issues, consider using walking poles. And if you need music or a podcast to stay motivated, make sure you're still aware of your environment to keep you safe and let you enjoy the journey. And as with most aspects of living a long, higher quality of life, overall wellness, staying fit may help reduce brain disease risk to help maintain cognitive strength. So walking now might keep you walking for years to come. I'm Susan Hogan, News 4. Thanks a lot, Susan, and be careful in that wooded area. We have another bear sighting. Uh-oh, where this latest bear was spotted roaming the streets. Welcome back and be sure to pay attention to the signs along two very busy Northern Virginia roads. The names Lee Highway and Lee Jackson Memorial Highway, named after Confederate generals, are about to go away forever. News 4 transportation reporter Adam Tuss has more. Yeah, no more Lee Highway or Lee Jackson Memorial Highway here in Northern Virginia now. It's just going to be routes 29 and 50. And this change is taking effect in a couple of weeks. July 5th is when it starts. And it's not just a big change for commuters along these super busy corridors here in Northern Virginia, as you see all the traffic moving here, and they're going to have to pay attention to some new road signage out here. But it's also a big change for businesses and residents. The Lee name is just about everywhere throughout some of these corridors. There are gas stations, swimming pools, and businesses that bear the name. Residents and business owners are being told by the county that they'll need to update address records once the changeover happens. Here at Lee Highway Gas and Auto Repair, the owner, who didn't want to speak on camera, tells us he doesn't want to change the name on his business. I just think uh, Lee Highway, it's just been... <laughs> 
it's, it's just the, the, the name. I don't, I don't think it really means anything. Yeah, uh, we'll just wait, and then if we have to get lawyers involved, we get lawyers involved, you know. Jeff McKay, the head of the Fairfax County Board of Supervisors, tells News 4, no one will be forced to change a name of a business, but there is a grant program that's been created to give these business owners the money to make the change if they want. It's, it's obvious that we're living... Uh, fortunately, in different times than we were when these names were established for these two roads. And so I think it's necessary to uh, make sure that our community uh, understands where our values are. The county appointed a Confederate Names Task Force in 2021 to study these name changes, and the task force voted overwhelmingly to make the switch. In Fairfax County, Adam Tuss, News 4. The Animal Welfare League of Arlington says they've received several reports of a young black bear roaming around on North Nelson Street Sunday morning. The league's current plan is to just let the bear make its way out of the county. Good luck. I hope he's safe. Yes. And that'll do it for the News 4 Rundown. Thanks for joining us. I'm Anyang. And I'm Tommy McFly. We'll see you back here tomorrow.